The Panama Canal has suddenly dried up, a big blow to the economies of many nations. Opened in 1914, this 82-kilometer-long waterway is an essential cost-cutting shortcut between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. It serves the transportation needs of many countries, including the United States, China, and South Korea. Why the sudden dryness? What's responsible for that? And most importantly, what is the implication for the world's economy? Stick with this video to the end as I unveil the mystery behind the dying canal. Before delving into the most recent revelations, it's crucial to understand the context. Dawn of the Panama Canal in the past, sailing a ship from the Atlantic to the Pacific was a hazardous and difficult voyage. The Drake Passage and the Strait of Magellan were two routes that sailors had to take to get around the tip of South America because of the dangerous waters and high winds. Then, Spanish explorers decided to start a life-changing project, the Panama Canal. The canal would be a great achievement because it would cut across the small landmass that separated North and South America. Ships could travel between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans in significantly less time, saving them days or even weeks of journey. So, how did it all begin? The Spanish explorers discovered how much simpler it would be to cross the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans if a canal existed. They first had other options, but later settled in Panama. That's because the United States had constructed a railroad there in the 1800s. Eventually, the railroad and canal happened to be almost along the same route. But did it happen that easily? In 1881, an initial effort was made to cut a canal through Panama's slender land bridge. At that time, Colombia was in charge of Panama. Therefore, they granted the Corp Universal du Canal in Terros, a French company, permission to build a canal there. The company's leader, Ferdinand de Lesseps, had so much faith that he would build the canal quickly because he had recently built the Suez Canal in Egypt without any challenge. So, motivated by his previous success, Ferdinand constructed a sea-level canal in Panama. This implies that the canal and the oceans on either side would be at the same level. To fund the construction, he was able to persuade a large number of individuals, particularly common people, to contribute money. However, not everyone supported Ferdinand's proposal. But why? Wasn't it what everyone had been waiting for? The reason is not far-fetched. Adolf Godin the Lapine, another skilled engineer, had previously examined the terrain in Panama and was certain it would not work. Why? He had studied the site's terrain and knew the plan wouldn't work. But then, Lep had a better alternative. The Rio Grande, flowing into the Pacific, and the Changes River, flowing into the Atlantic, were two large mountain ranges known as the Continental Divide, located approximately 15 kilometers from the Pacific Ocean. According to Lep, they can use both rivers to build artificial lakes. So, he proposed creating large lakes by building dams at two locations, Gatun and Miraflores. The water from these rivers would fill the lakes, which would be about 25 meters deep. He then suggested creating a channel through the mountains to connect the lakes. He further said they should use locks to raise and lower ships between the different water levels to connect them to the ocean. However, even though the engineers applauded Lep's idea, the French construction company didn't use it. The company rejected his idea and continued with its original vision. Unfortunately, this only led to failure because Ferdinand was unprepared for the difficulties he would face in Panama. He was wrong to compare Panama with Egypt, but that was catastrophic. Panama differs completely from the dry and predictable environment he encountered while building the Suez Canal. It was a humid, disease-ridden jungle with intense downpours, heat, and harsh terrain that started from coastal swamps to the towering mountains of the Continental Divide. Even with capable engineers, the overall plan lacked a clear direction and plan to attack the present circumstances. The machinery they brought was unsuited for Panama's difficult terrain. The manufacturers made it for the desert-like conditions of the Suez Canal, which ultimately led to the project's end. To top it all off, the workers and engineers battled with tropical illnesses that took many lives. To cut back costs, the French business moved from a sea level to a less expensive design that used locks to alter water levels. Regretfully, the problem didn't get much better after this adjustment. As the project showed no signs of being lucrative, the French people started to lose faith in the canal and its commander. After many failed attempts, the business finally filed for bankruptcy in 1889. The engineers made diverse efforts to resurrect the company in 1894. However, 
all their efforts didn't yield any fruit. Eventually, the company stopped operation in 1898, marking the end of its goal to build the Panama Canal. But is that the end of the story? Of course not. Even though the gold died in the hands of the French, it came alive in the hands of a new country. Surprisingly, this country didn't use much of the French excavation labor. So, which country took up the project? The emergence of the Americans. In 1902, the Congress of the United States passed the Spooner Act. This act permitted the United States to purchase the French company's resources, equipment, and the authority to construct the canal. However, there was one very important requirement. They needed to strike a deal with Colombia, the country in charge of Panama at the time. Unfortunately, the talks with Colombia came to a standstill. Sensing an opportunity, Panama declared its independence from Colombia in November 1903 with the support of the United States. With all restrictions out, the United States and Panama started their negotiations. This led to the signing of the Heherane Treaty in February 1994. This contract established the Panama Canal Zone, wherein the United States would have jurisdiction over the canal and its surrounding lands. This satisfied the requirements outlined in the Spooner Act. The United States started construction on the canal in the summer of 1904. After observing the French experience, they constructed a canal with locks to save money and prevent any issues arising from differential sea levels on either side. That sounds like there won't be any further issues. But you are wrong. The Americans were just about to unearth new challenges. The first barrier was the Shagers River. This river's water levels varied significantly according to the rain that fell, flowing from the mountains in northern Panama to the Atlantic Ocean. If they construct the canal close to a river, unchecked flooding might quickly overwhelm it. President Theodore Roosevelt made a crucial choice in 1906. He sided with head engineer John Frank Stevens, who favored a canal with locks comparable to Lepp's initial proposal, which was the same proposal that the French rejected. This concept called for constructing a sizable dam at Gatton to span the Shagers River. This served two purposes. First, it produced the Gatun Lake. This was, at the time, the biggest lake in the world, and it helped regulate the flow of the Shagers River. And secondly, the lake grew to represent a substantial section of the 20-mile canal path. The construction project was a huge operation that involved more than 40,000 workers. At its height, most of the workforce comprised laborers from the West Indies, while most engineers, administrators, and skilled laborers were from the United States. They needed strong tools and equipment to build the enormous canal. So, railroads became essential for moving supplies and commodities all over. Using more than 100 steam shovels was one of the biggest innovations during the operation. These enormous excavators were essential in excavating the Calabra Cut, which was subsequently dubbed Guyard Cut in honor of the American architect David Doe Guyard, who managed the project's development until his death. But in 1913, the Calabra Cut was among the most difficult parts of the undertaking. Due to the unstable rock and soil, there were frequent mudslides and landslides in the area. Tragically, many lives were lost while building it. Forecasting and planning for these erratic movements of the earth and mud was challenging, and the weight of the nearby hillsides may even cause the excavation's bottom to rise unexpectedly. The Cucaracha Slide of 1907 is one particularly well-known incident. This relentless landslide occurred for years, depositing millions of cubic yards of material into the canal excavation and causing serious setbacks. The laborers persisted in the face of these difficulties, frequently working in sweltering heat that reached 38 degrees Celsius. They used a variety of instruments, including steam shovels, dynamite, and rock drills, to remove 73 million cubic meters of rock and earth. This unwavering labor made the future possible, eventually dropping the excavation floor within 40 feet of sea level. Despite many difficulties, disappointments, and deaths, the Panama Canal officially opened for traffic on the 15th of 1914. You must be eager to hear how this canal has benefited the people, businesses, and government. But first, you need to know how the canal works because this has contributed to its drying up. So, how does it work? How the canal works? The Panama River doesn't work like every other canal. When a ship arrives at the canal's entrance, it encounters a series of three separate locks divided by gates. The sea level ship travels into the first lock when the first gate opens. The gates behind the ship close, and then a valve pumps water from the second lock into the first lock, 
which lowers the water level in the second lock and raises the water level and the ship in the first lock. When the water levels between both locks become equivalent, the second gate is opened and the ship travels through the second lock. Then, the second gates are closed and repeated, leveling the water between the second and third locks. The third gate opens up. The ship travels into the third lock. The water level is raised again from the lake on the other side, and the third gate opens up. The ship travels into the third lock. That's how they raise the ships 26 miles from where they started at sea level. Then, they can effortlessly travel the rest of the way across Panama, largely over Lake Gatun, which is 26 m up in elevation. This lake was artificially created by damming the nearby Shagers River to flood the interior. When the ship reaches the other end of Lake Gatun, it must be lowered back to the sea through the same process. It's undoubtedly a genius design built to overcome Panama's hilly topography. However, the big issue with this process is that it requires much fresh water to function. When the ship enters that first lock, the water level within the lock is raised by the water being pumped into it from the second lock, originally coming down the chain from Lake Gatun. But then, to accept the next ship into the canal from sea level, that extra water in the first lock has to be emptied into the ocean, and this is the same on either of the canal's ends. The canal uses water from two artificially created freshwater reservoirs nearby, Lake Aloha and Lake Gatun, with Lake Gatun being the primary source. Each transit through the Panama Canal consumes around 52 million gallons of fresh water from these reservoirs, which makes the whole process possible. The water that's lost from the reservoirs is usually replenished with rainfall. So, as long as the rain continues replenishing the lakes, the water that the canal drains from the lakes will keep getting replenished, and the canal can continue operating as usual. But what happens during a really bad drought when no rain falls? The system breaks down, and your guess is as good as mine. The canal begins to dry. So, from the start, how it works defines how it dies. But then, there is more to this. Before we discuss that, let's look at the canal's influence on international commerce. The Panama Canal and Commerce One of the most notable and influential engineering feats ever attempted was the Panama Canal. Records show that the canal recorded more than 15,000 transits in 1970. Since then, the volume of cargo that the canal carries has increased. The number of ships using the canal as a means of navigation is a useful indication of the general health of the world economy. A spike in traffic is observed on the channel during periods of worldwide economic expansion, while during recessions, activity decreases. 86 ships only use the canal during a difficult financial period. You could tell if world commerce was thriving just by noting the number of ships or cargoes that passed the canal. Although many routes use the canal, trade between East Asia and the United States East Coast dominates them all. A large amount of the canal's traffic goes via this route. It travels across the Panama Canal carrying a variety of commodities, including coal, wheat, petroleum products, and motor vehicles. The East Coast depends on it to remain connected to Asia, while the West Coast relies on it to remain connected to Europe. The canal is also of vital strategic interest to the United States Navy as it enables American naval assets to rapidly redeploy across different theaters of operation between the Pacific and Atlantic during crises. The canal used to be outrightly owned by the United States for decades between when they finished building it in 1914 until 1979, when the Carter administration agreed to give the land back to Panama, where it was jointly controlled by the United States and Panama for another 20 years until the start of the new millennium on January 1, 2000 when full sovereign control over the canal was finally handed over to Panama. During that long period when America directly owned the canal, it proved to be a vital asset on more than one occasion. During the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, the United States was able to use the canal to rapidly redeploy warships from the Pacific Theater into the Caribbean to assist with the naval blockades that Washington enforced on Cuba. During the Korean and Vietnam Wars, the United States Navy used the canal as its primary artery to transport troops and equipment to the military front lines in Asia. Today, even though Washington no longer owns the canal, it remains vital to the United States. Suppose any war breaks out between them and China. In that case, the Panama Canal enabled American warships based on the U.S. East Coast to rapidly redeploy to the Pacific and reach the theater of operations 18 days sooner than if they had to travel the long way around South America. If the invasion ever happens, 
18 critical days saved could become vital to ensuring the war's outcome. The canal is also the most vital asset the Panamanian government owns because the canal shortcut is vital to many economic and military interests worldwide. So, if this canal is drying, the Panamanian government would lose a fortune. But how much exactly? We will get to that in the video. Water crisis in the canal. Remember how the canal works. An astounding 52 million gallons of water are needed for each trip through the Panama Canal. I have noted that ships traversing the various water level portions are raised and lowered using this fresh water. This water comes from artificial lakes, namely Gatun Lake, whose levels are maintained by rainfall. However, most rainwater eventually runs back into the ocean, posing a special challenge. This is because the 4.3 million people who live in Panama depend on the same water sources for drinking water, making it difficult to strike a balance between the canal's needs and those of the people. However, the Panamanian government didn't see this problem coming. Being one of the wettest nations on Earth, Panama has historically seen much rainfall along the canal and the adjacent lakes. Nevertheless, things worsened in 2023, particularly in Gatun Lake. Two factors combined to lower the water levels significantly. The first was a general drop in precipitation, which resulted in a shortfall relative to average levels. The second factor was the El Nino weather phenomenon. Warmer ocean temperatures during El Nino, which happens every few years, disrupt air circulation patterns. This disturbance attenuates or shifts winds that usually bring heavy precipitation to Panama and other tropical nations. Let's dive more into this to understand what it means. El Nino is a regular oceanic and climatic phenomenon that cyclically repeats every two to seven years in the central and east-central Pacific Ocean. During an El Nino event, the usual trade winds that blow from the east to the west, pushing warm water away from the Americas to the west, begin to weaken, pushing warm water back further to the east towards America's west coast. This prevents deeper, colder waters from upwelling toward the surface. This big patch of warm water on the west coast disrupts the area's usual atmospheric circulation pattern. Thus, the winds that usually carry rains into Panama weaken or fail altogether. This began. In 2023, however, El Nino has been much more severe this time than historically normal. Panama's October 2023 rainfall was 41% lower than historically usual. This is the lowest level ever recorded in Panama's history since record-keeping began in the 1950s, and October is usually the rainiest month of the year for the country. Overall, the 2023 rainy season failed to materialize, with the government reporting that the year saw the second lowest rainfall ever measured in Panama's history. Built more than 100 years ago, back in the early 20th century, before modern climate change and climatic effects were well understood, the Panama Canal was never originally designed. With this severe reduction in rainfall in the future ever being in mind, without the rains replenishing the lakes and the canal still consuming huge amounts of water from the lakes to continue operating, the lake's water levels have been decreasing to unprecedentedly dangerous levels, down to about 3M lower. And yet, Panama is still in the middle of the dry season. This means the lakes are not getting any water until the next rainy season, which is not even sure. Nino events typically last 9 to 12 months. However, as the effects of climate change worsen worldwide, El Nino has sometimes lasted longer, and it can sometimes even last for years. There are speculations that the ongoing El Nino has a 60% chance of lasting longer, which means that this year's rainy season in Panama will also become disrupted. Without a doubt, the lakes in the country will continue struggling to replenish themselves. This ultimately means that the Panama Canal will keep running out of water from these lakes and must continue functioning. And that means only one thing. The canal might keep drying up, posing a big problem to the nation and the world. But then, What's the main cause of this problem? We've said that El Nino might be a major cause of this. However, isn't that just looking at a small portion of a bigger problem? Deforestation's role in the Panama Canal water crisis. The recent water shortage that has affected the Panama Canal has highlighted the intricate interdependencies among our planet systems. Although the primary cause of the shortage is insufficient rainfall, scientists have identified a surprising factor exacerbating the issue, deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. 
Even though it is hundreds of kilometers away, the Amazon rainforest significantly impacts the Panama Canal's water levels. Through a process known as transpiration, lush rainforests like the Amazon send enormous volumes of water vapor into the atmosphere, which condenses and eventually forms clouds. Before returning is rain, establishing a self-sustaining cycle. Because of its enormous size, the Amazon is sometimes called the planet's air conditioning system because it affects regional rainfall patterns and even controls the global climate. However, deforestation upsets this delicate cycle because when trees are cut down, they cannot release water vapor into the atmosphere, which lowers the overall amount of rainfall. As deforestation continues, the rainforest can reach a tipping point where it can no longer produce enough rain to sustain itself. This is a process known as deforestation-induced collapse. This alarming trend creates a dangerous domino effect as the rainforest releases more carbon and experiences less rainfall. The situation in the Amazon rainforest is even more concerning than initially realized. Deforestation affects rainfall patterns, and mounting evidence shows that parts of the Amazon are becoming net emitters of carbon dioxide, meaning they release more carbon than they absorb. A vicious cycle results from the trees being weaker and more vulnerable to dying due to a lack of moisture, lessening the rainforest capacity to create rain. The weakening of the rainforest makes it more likely to have longer-lasting and more intense droughts, like the one that occurred in 2023. This affects the Amazon and local and regional rain cycles, which may result in drier climates, thousands of miles to the north and south of the rainforest. Therefore, there's a clear sign that deforestation is a major issue in Panama. The drying canal has many consequences. The agency overseeing the Panama Canal Authority was forced to make a difficult decision due to the water shortage. They have restricted the number of ships permitted to sail through the canal under normal conditions. They were forced to drastically reduce traffic, allowing only about 20 ships to pass daily. This unexpected challenge has put shipping companies in a difficult position. Normally, the canal can handle a steady flow of up to 36 ships navigating its waters daily. They are now faced with several difficult decisions, each with a disadvantage. One alternative is to remain anchored and incur large expenses until a desired slot becomes available for passage through the canal. This waiting game can go on for weeks, reducing profits. For corporations prepared to pay a high cost, paying a search fee of $4 million allows them to bypass other waiting vessels and cut down on the time they must wait. However, this alternative involves a significant financial expense, which not many businesses can or will bear. Faced with these restrictions, many businesses have completely avoided the canal. These ships take a different path around South America, passing through the Strait of Melon or the Cape Horn. This method has a different cost even though it avoids the wait hours and possible fees related to the canal. This includes lengthier travels, lasting several days or even weeks. Water restrictions in the Panama Canal come after recent attacks on ships passing through the Red Sea, a vital trade route. These attacks have already caused many businesses to steer clear of the Suez Canal, and the combined impact of these disruptions is placing a great deal of pressure on global shipping, potentially resulting in delays and disruptions in the global delivery of goods. Because disruptions in the flow of goods can lead to price rises, this condition makes it more difficult for governments to regulate inflation. Concerns about their finances are not the only ones that traders affected by the water scarcity have. A major accident is likely when more ships are lining up to enter the canal at the Atlantic and Pacific exits. Because of the increasing congestion, ships must stay at anchor for prolonged periods, sometimes even days. The proximity of several vessels in crowded situations increases the potential for collisions. Solutions given the current water scarcity and its effects on the Panama Canal, it is reasonable to wonder how this essential waterway can be preserved. Although some have proposed pumping seawater into the canal's primary water source, Gatun Lake, this approach is not workable. Panama relies heavily on Gatun Lake for its drinking water. Therefore, Adding salt water would be catastrophic for the nation's water security. Other plans raise concerns, such as rerouting rivers to feed the canal. Although these ideas could help with water scarcity, they frequently negatively impact the environment. 
Already established river flows can harm ecosystems and even jeopardize the livelihood and cultural practices of indigenous groups living along these waterways. Dealing with the Panama Canal water scarcity locally might not be sufficient. Experts caution that addressing the core cause of the issue, climate change and its continued deforestation of the Amazon rainforest, will be a more comprehensive strategy. As previously noted, scientific data indicates that deforestation in the Amazon is causing climate change, a primary cause of the water scarcity affecting the Panama Canal. Nevertheless, Certain South American nations containing portions of the Amazon rainforest have taken individual steps to reduce deforestation. Nations can benefit from one another's effective deforestation policies and tactics. Experts also think the U.S. should be more actively involved in the fight against Amazon deforestation, since it has a stake in maintaining a working Panama Canal, with more than half of the population depending on the same water sources that feed the canal. The lack of water has undoubtedly put Panama's officials in a tough position as they attempt to balance the people's demands and the Panama Canal. To overcome this obstacle, the governing board of the canal has suggested constructing a new reservoir on the Indio River. This project intends to improve water supply and traffic through the canal, a crucial economic driver for Panama, accounting for more than 6% of the nation's GDP. The design states that the enlarged reservoir might enable 12 to 15 ships to travel through the canal daily. However, this plan has some difficulties. Building the reservoir is expected to cost close to $900 million, a substantial financial commitment for Panama. The completion time frame is similarly questionable because a recent project to expand the canals. Locks ran two years behind schedule and encountered financial disagreements. The rate of construction also raises environmental issues. Careful consideration must be given to the possible effects on the local environment, which includes plant and animal life, river flow, and water quality. The proposal would also include purchasing protected territory and possibly uprooting nearby populations. This raises moral questions regarding minimizing social and economic upheaval while providing impacted parties fair compensation and relocation. Consequently, even though the proposed reservoir offers a potential remedy, it's critical to balance the advantages to the economy against any potential costs to the environment and society. The Panama Canal's future and the welfare of the Panamanian people depend on a solution that considers social and environmental responsibilities and economic considerations. The future of the Panama Canal is currently in jeopardy, and the enormous ramifications of its collapse are a possibility. Because the shortcut through the canal is so important to numerous military and economic interests worldwide, Panama can impose different fees and tolls on every ship that uses it. In 2022 alone, when the canal was operating normally, the Panama Canal brought in an astounding $4.32 billion in revenue for the country's government. Therefore, the canal accounted for over 65% of Panama's total GDP. Since Panama is essentially a state with control over this point, it is unsurprising that the nation's most densely populated region follows the canal's route. The canal's route is largely responsible for Panama's current status as one of Latin America's wealthiest and most developed nations. Without the canal, the whole nation, the entire globalized economy, and the United States' strategic interests would be in serious jeopardy. Regretfully, the canal started to deteriorate last year in 2023 and continues through today in 2024, making its future suddenly very uncertain. Thanks for watching another episode. While you're still here, check out the other videos you see on your screen.